Hey, hey everybody, hope you're doing well today. This is Brad Cartwright, and today we're gonna to take a look at how to draw economic growth on an aggregate supply, aggregate demand diagram, a relatively simple diagram, but something that's really important for your studies of macroeconomics. This is part of the How to Draw series, a collaborative effort between me and you. Thanks for all the comments and suggestions for all of these videos, I really appreciate it. All right, let's take a look at how to draw economic growth on a macro aggregate supply, aggregate demand diagram. All right, well, the first question you always got to ask yourself, if you've been watching this whole series, I've been saying this over and over and over again, the first question you got to ask yourself is, where does the story of showing economic growth on a diagram begin? And the answer is, in macroeconomics, right here. And if you don't know how to draw this diagram, it's the macroeconomic aggregate demand, aggregate supply diagram. Watch the video right there, okay? Because that video is going to give you a little secret as to how to know exactly how to draw this diagram perfect every single time. The macroeconomic aggregate demand, aggregate supply diagram, whether it be the neoclassical model like this or the Keynesian model, which you can use that model as well. Um, there's a how to draw the Keynesian model as well. You can check on it right there. Um, is your key to understanding and properly showing all sorts of macroeconomic stories on a diagram. Because that's the other thing that you've been following this whole series. Like, listen, man, there are, there are many human stories on every diagram, right? This aggregate demand curve is representative of all demanders. Those are like real, real people. And these are all suppliers. And those are like real, real people who have like jobs and things, you know? It's not just like some random red line like that's that's representative of people and these economies are human behavior and so that's how they function all right so uh showing that now the thing is what's economic growth well economic growth is any increase in real gdp right economic growth is going to be an increase in real gdp so if y1 represents the current this equilibrium pl1 y1 represents the current equilibrium price or quantity combination, average price level and real GDP, quantity being total output in an economy, then there's only really three ways that we can move outward, right? And the reason there are three ways is that there's one, two, three lines. So any combination of factors or any one factor that would affect aggregate demand or the short run aggregate supply curve or the long run aggregate supply curve would, would, uh, would result in an outward movement of what? Y1. What would that mean? Increase in real GDP, which of course is economic growth. Okay, so one way to show that, the first and definitely the easiest way to show that, is by an increase in aggregate demand. Okay, so the first way that you can show economic growth on a diagram is to show an outward movement of aggregate demand out to a d2. Okay, and that's a two, right? Now, what does that show us? Well, that creates a new equilibrium price quantity combination right there. Okay, and that's going to lead us to have PL2 for average price level two and Y2. There it is, right? The first way you can show economic growth on a diagram is showing an increase in aggregate demand. And of course, that would happen from any one combination of the things that contribute to aggregate demand, and that is consumption, investment, um, government spending, and a an balance of imports and exports, right? Would result in increased price levels. So this is inflationary pressure. This is where you can see a whole bunch of stuff. This is where all the stories come in, right? If there's economic growth out to there, then there's going to be inflationary pressure, and there's also going to be a decrease in unemployment. And the reason you know that is that this right here represents increased output. And the only reason, only way that they increase output is by increasing employment. Okay? So that's the first way that you can show uh, an increase in economic growth on a macroeconomic diagram. All right, here's the second. This story is going to begin at the same place, right? This is the neoclassical aggregate supply, aggregate demand diagram. And the second way we could show an outward movement or an increase in real GDP is if, for some reason, there were an increase in 
the short run aggregate supply curve, which would result in a new short run curve of S R A S 2. And that's going to result in downward pressure on price levels, or deflationary pressure, and an increase, though, in output, which, of course, is what we need to show in order to show an increase in, uh, in growth or economic growth, right? So whenever the, the short-run aggregate supply curve shifts outward, I should add one more thing right here, a little arrow saying, boop, moved outward. That is actually a good sign, right? Because we've increased output, and yet we've reduced the average price level, or the average price level has come down, right? And that would happen as a result of a reduction in any of the factors, that's PL2 right there, any of the factors that contribute to the short-run aggregate supply curve, okay? So any reduction in cost, maybe a massive, massive drop in oil prices, for example, might cause that. Okay, so there is the second way to show economic growth on a neoclassical aggregate supply, aggregate demand diagram by moving by an outward shift of the short-run aggregate supply curve. Now, there is a third way. How do we know that? Because there's a third line. Here we go. So, again, start the story over. Where does the story begin? The story always begins in the same place, which is the neoclassical aggregate demand, aggregate supply diagram. And again, what we want to show is an outward shift of um, GDP out to somewhere here. And because it's the last curve, or the only curve we haven't shifted, you guessed it, that's what it's going to be. It's going to be a shift of the long-run aggregate supply curve out there, which will result in L R oh, L R A S 2. That's an outward shift, and we are going to have Y2. And what this would do is also create a downward pressure on price levels, and create a PL2 right here, price level 2, right, and a Y2 there. So the thing is, that's the thing that's different about the long-run aggregate supply curve is that, and I always tell my students, like, listen, the short run all the ways follows the long run, right? So a shift of the long-run aggregate supply curve is something that's massive inside, massive and permanent, it's pretty much permanent within, a, in a, within an economy. Right. What are the things that cr contribute to an outward movement of long-run aggregate supply curve? Anything that in contributes to the long-run increase in the quantity or the quanti quality of the factors of production. Okay. So what are the factors of production? Land, labor, capital. Right. So if there's a massive war and our country wins the war, Chile takes over all, all of Argentina. No offense to the Argentinians out there. Right. What happens? Well, they have a whole bunch more land. So their production could increase quite significantly, quite quickly. Right. Obviously, the capacity, the full level of employment, that's what this also represents, could increase quite quickly, right? And, uh, or it could be maybe an increase in immigrants, an increased population, right? Land, labor, more labor in um, a particular country could result in the, the output or the increase of the long-run aggregate supply curve. The other thing, which would be permanent, is like mass, Chile has very, very, if very, very small um, uh, prospects of this, but if let's say they just discovered a massive, 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 massive underground oil reserve in Chile, well, obviously the capacity of the nation would move outward because that can create a downward pressure and an increase in the overall capacity of a country, right? So this is also considered to be sort of good growth in the sense that it's permanent. And one of the things that would quickly follow, by the way, and you don't usually draw this, but it just, I'm just kind of screaming out to me is the short run would then shift out as well, something to that, because the, the, the long run always pulls the short run with it, okay? But you usually don't draw two diagrams in economics. But anyway, at least in, in IB economics, so this would be S-R-A-S-2, okay? So there's the third way of showing outward movement um, of, ag of economic growth, okay? So that's pretty cool. All right, now let's take a look at this next slide which is done by Jocelyn Blink. Jocelyn Blink puts together a beautifully well done and very effective IB economics course companion, a textbook that's excellent. And what she did with these two slides, and that's why I put them in here because I think they're so excellent, is show, I just showed this, right? I just showed growth 
on a long run aggregates on the neoclassical model. But you can also show growth on a production possibilities curve. If you don't know what a production possibilities curve is, check out the video right there on how to draw a production possibilities curve. And you can understand how this is constructed. But on a production possibilities curve, this green line represents the total possible production possibilities, imagine that, of a particular country, right? And so in this case, and by the way, you, you, th this is like, uh, um, they go like this, okay? So scenario one is on top, right? Uh, well, that, I, I could do it this way. Watch this, okay? So here is, here is point A and that point A, and they're analogous to one another, okay? So one way to show growth is to move aggregate demand outward, which is what I did on the first slide in here is to pull it out there, right? That's one way you could do it. Okay, so check it out. Jocelyn Blink did that right here. So shift your eyes from there to here, and what you see is A to B, right? Well, that is an outward shift of economic growth. Look at the, um, this economy was underperforming, right? And then aggregate demand moved outward. So it was operating here, and it moved outward. A, operating there, underperforming, and A to B, it moved outward, okay? So one of the things to look at is there's a, oh, there's a relationship between this long-run aggregate supply curve, by the way, and the production possibilities curve. Do you see how far away A is from the long-run aggregate supply curve? And then how far A is from the production possibilities curve? And then when there's economic growth by an increase in aggregate demand out there, it got AB got closer here. Now, the one difference is that this is like max, max, max capacity of all things in an economy. Whereas the long-run aggregate supply curve recognizes that that's not really possible. And this is where you would see like natural rate of unemployment of 5%. And also a reasonable acceptance of that like at least one stove is going to not be functioning in your pizza <laughs> somewhere in a restaurant in the country. One taxi is going to be broken, right? And the production possibility is going to be like all things were hitting on all cylinders at all the time. So you can show short-term economic growth by a movement on the neoclassical model from A to B, from A to B, or you can show the same thing for on, a, on a production possibilities curve from A to A to B, okay? So those are analogous to one another. Pretty cool, pretty cool, pretty cool. All right, one last scenario. And this is where it's the long-term movement of uh, the long-term economic growth. And long-term economic growth is pretty permanent. And we already talked about what would happen on a... Um, neoclassical model and the long run aggregate supply curve would move out and I mentioned that then there would be an, a, an analogous short run movement there, right? And therefore the economy would operate right here. But if you notice, the whole long run aggregate supply curve moved outward, right? And so the way you would show long term growth on the neoclassical model is right there as we did in the third scenario on the slides before but you can also do that on a production possibilities curve and that means that the whole curve moves outward. So remember, we're here with the long and aggregate supply curve in the previous two slides back. I said this is going to be an increase in the quantity or the quality of the factors of production, as is this. Because this represents a permanent shift. If we take over Argentina, we're Chilenos, we take over Argentina, we would have more land and therefore more production possibilities. If we had an influx of immigrants to Chile, which is what's happening right now, a lot of Haitians and Venezuelans and Colombians are coming to Chile because of the, the, the economy here is thriving, that actually increases the production possibilities of Chile, and you could show it either way. So it's pretty cool. Short run, long run, economic growth sounds pretty simple, but there are actually three ways of showing it, and also it's two different graphs you have in your arsenal to show it in terms of um, showing growth, right? Economic growth. One of the five key factors or key elements of any economy is, or government, is to increase um, growth, right? Pretty cool. Well, there you have it, my friends, how to draw economic growth on an aggregate supply, aggregate demand diagram. Relatively simple, but an important thing for you to be able to do in your studies of macroeconomics. Again, as I said at the beginning of this uh, video, this is the How to Draw series, a collaborative effort between me and you. The things that you want to see on diagrams, what are they? What are the diagrams you want me to include in this series? Put them in the comment box below. Also, so that we can stay in contact with one another, please be sure to subscribe and turn on those notifications Vacations. I see it as an incredible, incredible honor and privilege to be able to connect with so many students around the world. Please, let's keep the dialogue going between the two of us. Economics tells you so much about the world be 
the world around us beyond just the economics. Economics is the underpinnings of all political thought. I hope you found this video to be helpful. I hope you find this entire series on how to draw a, a, an incredibly in, informative and helpful part of your studies of economics. Good deal, my friends. Be good to one another out there, and we'll talk to you in a bit.